Hey right, guys, welcome back to another lecture. Uh, we're gonna go over chapter 128 today, dry chest and CV joints. This one should be a pretty quick lecture. It's actually very straightforward, real simple stuff to understand. It's kind of like clutches. Uh, first, let's go over our object objectives today. I'm going to describe dry shaft design and balance, describe the function and operation of U-joints, and discuss the two types of CV joints and how they work. And I have the two examples right here, so when we start getting into CV joints, I'm going to show you guys, and I actually give you a good demonstration on them. Dry shafts. Purpose and function. A dry shaft transmits engine torque from the transmission or transaxle, if it's front wheel drive, to the rear axle assembly or drive wheels. Dry shaft design, most drive shafts are constructed of hollow steel tubing. Some vehicle manufacturers use an aluminum dry shaft. Then I'll go over the difference between the two, why we use aluminum and why we use steel. Composite material dry shafts also used in some vehicles. Composite material meaning carbon fiber, you know, different types of actual materials, um, say more of a composite material. Rather than actually having steel or aluminum, we're actually using something more like, say, carbon fiber or a uh, very strong durable plastic. The typical rear wheel drive powertrain arrangement, the engine is mounted longitudinal or lengthwise. So when they're talking longitudinal, what they're actually meaning is that the engine is going down the length of the actual engine bay. If you think of transverse, you think of the engine being sideways. For longitudinal, we're actually talking about it being straight back, so it actually points towards the rear wheels. And most rear wheel drive vehicles are gonna have a longitudinal um, engine design or engine uh, setup. Now, the parts that we're mostly going to be focusing on today are going to be this section here, this section here. Now, when you talk rear wheel drive, uh, we don't necessarily have half, uh, half shafts or axles, the CV axles. That only goes into play with independent rear suspension. But let's just focus on the basics right now, just talking about the U-joints for the dry shaft and also what materials the dry shaft are actually made out of. On a rear-wheel drive vehicle, the dry shaft transmits engine torque from the transmission to the rear axle assembly and drive wheels. On a front-wheel drive vehicle, dry shafts, also called axle shafts, transmit torque from the transaxle to each, front, uh, each of the front drive wheels. So now we're talking about a transverse design or a front-wheel drive design. First things first, when you notice this design here, we have your engine set up with the transmission or transaxle. But what do you notice about the two joints that are, the two axles that actually go out to the wheels? Yes, that is correct. One of them is going to be shorter than the other. Now, what is this? What comes into play here when you actually have one axle shorter than the other? Yes, you're going to have what is known as torque steer. When you accelerate um, on a front wheel drive vehicle, if one shaft is actually longer than the other shaft, the amount of twist and torque that the uh, engine is going to transmit to each of the axles is going to be different, which then causes the wheel to actually turn when you're stepping on the uh, stepping on the gas. So if you have one that's super long like this and one that's super short like this, which side do you think is going to is which direction do you think it's going to pull? Is it going to pull to the driver's side or is it going to pull to the passenger side? No, no, not the passenger side. It's going to pull to the driver's side. Yes, because it's shorter, it's going to transmit more torque towards the driver's side than the actual passenger side. Typical dry shaft, also called a prop shaft or propeller shaft, the dry shaft transfers engine power from the transmission to the differential. Now, when you think about how suspension is set up, there's one key element to why we actually use a dry shaft instead of just a direct solid piece of steel going from the transmission to the actual differential. The reason why is what is attached or what, what is the axle, how does the axle attach to the frame? It utilizes suspension. So with that suspension going up and down, what does that do to the distance between the differential and the transmission? It'll actually start to change. So as the, the suspension goes lower than the transmission, it gets further away. So we need to be able to compensate for that. And we utilize what is known as a slip yoke. The slip yoke slides into the transmission output shaft and it allows for that difference in change of uh, when the suspension height, basically as it goes up and down, it allows it to slide out to get longer, and it allows it to slide in to get shorter. So the lower, you, when you lower a vehicle, the transmission is actually gonna be pushing in deeper into the actual transmission. This dry shaft was found to be dented during a visual inspection and has to be replaced. Now, 
talking about the different materials. When we utilize aluminum for our dry shafts, the one thing that you're gonna notice is you're gonna have more, they're gonna be more prone to damage. The reason why is it's a softer metal, it's gonna cause it to dent or to bend uh, a lot easier than actually steel dry shafts. But when you have a aluminum dry shaft, you're gonna notice it's gonna be a lot lighter than a steel dry shaft, even if it's a larger diameter. Most aluminum dry shafts are gonna be a lot fatter and a lot bigger than steel dry shafts due to the fact that they need more strength. So they're gonna up the size of it to allow for that torque that's being exerted from the transmission to the differential. When you have a steel dry shaft, you're gonna notice it's a lot smaller, but at the same time, the same if you have a dry shaft that's aluminum for that cer a certain vehicle and a dry shaft that's steel for the same vehicle, that steel dry shaft is still gonna be a lot heavier than the aluminum, e aluminum one, even though the aluminum one's a lot, uh, has a bigger diameter on it. But for aluminum dry shafts, Unfortunately, if you see damage, or steel, steel as well, if you see damage to the actual dry shaft, you're going to want to recommend replacement of the dry shaft because that could cause an imbalance and a heavy vibration, especially something this severe. Looks like they hit something while they were driving down the road. A center support bearing is used on many vehicles with, two, uh, with long two-part dry shafts. So this goes more towards like trucks and you know heavy-duty haulers. You think about how big, you know, if they have a long bed, it's, it's the transmission is so much further apart from the differential. So instead of having one giant dry shaft that's 12 feet long, we actually have two smaller six foot dry shafts. And the first section that's from the transmission to the actual carrier bearing is going to be pretty much solid mounted. It's going to have a slip yoke on it, but it really doesn't move. It's the second portion that goes from the uh, center carrier down to the differential. That's the part that's actually going to be going in and out and actually changing its distance. Um, it's going to have a isolator, so it's going to be a rubber seal all the way around along with a bearing. So it actually will support and it'll allow it to spin uh, using that bearing inside. Some drive shafts use rubber between the inner and outer housing to absorb vibrations and shocks to the drive line. So this drive shaft actually is a two-piece drive shaft. The center has a rubber isolator in between, so they have an inner sleeve, the rubber isolator throughout the dry shaft, and then the outer sleeve, and it's all pressed and molded together. What is the purpose of the dry shaft? So take a quick second, think about it. So what, what do we utilize dry shafts for? We use them to transmit engine torque to the dry wheels. Without dry shafts or without axle shafts, we have no go, because there's nothing connecting the transmission to the differential. Dry shaft balance. Dry shaft balance should be within 0.5% of the dry shaft weight. To get a replacement dry shaft, it is usually necessary to know if the series of U joints, type or style of U joints, and center to center distance between the U joints themselves. U joint design. So now we're talking about where we can get those angles from, from the transmission to the actual differential. You think about it, it's not a straight line, it doesn't go straight across. So we need to be able to still allow rotation but have that angle actually be able to be changed. A simple universal joint can be made of two Y-shaped yokes connected by a cross member called a cross or spider. The forearms of the cross are called trunnions. U-joints allow the wheels and the rear axle to move up and down, remain flexible, and still transfer torque to the drive wheels. Universal joints used in a typical drive shaft should have a working angle of one half to three degrees. It doesn't seem like a lot, but when you think about just how much the suspension moves up and down, the angle shouldn't really change all that much. That's why we allow about two and a half, uh, yeah, about two and a half degrees of actual angle change. Because when you think about when the suspension goes up and down, that angle is gonna change as the, uh, the suspension flexes. So the trunnions, this is just a basic design of it. This is the, the, the universal style of design. Now we have the trunnions on each side. These, these are gonna have needle bearings in them. This is just the basic ones. And then you have your yokes. When they're molded together, it allows for that flexibility and that movement, but also while they rotate. So the rotation will still, you'll still be able to have it flex and move, um, but it's not gonna cause any binding. But when we get into lowering a vehicle and uh, especially raising or lifting a vehicle, that's where you can run into binding issues with that, uh, that style U-joint. How the speed difference on the tip output of a typical U-joint varies with the speed and angle of the U-joint itself. So as the angle starts to increase, 
you're gonna get a distance or a change in actual RPM or speed. So if you have the dry shaft coming down to the actual differential, it's gonna be spinning on both on different speeds. That's where we get binding. That's where we can get run into a lot of issues, especially with an excessive angle on them. That's why we wanna have it between one half and three degrees and allow for that movement and allow for that change. The U-joint angle is the difference between the angles of the joint. So when you have your output, uh, your input shaft, or sorry, the output shaft from the transmission, you basically want to draw an invisible line through the actual shaft itself. Then you have where the actual dry shaft, once it gets inserted in, that angle coming down. So the angle in between here is going to be your actual, um, the, the difference between the input and the output. So as it rotates, you can see it's going to be causing it to bend back and bend back down. So if you have too much of an angle, then you start running into interference where this portion of the trunnion or this, this portion of the yoke is actually going to bash on the other side of the yoke as well. Sometimes they self clear, meaning that they're rough enough to where they don't touch anymore later on, but that's not the way you want to do it. You want to actually start to adjust and they make spacers for the differential to actually pitch it up if you're too far down, because that's, that's what happens most of the time is when you lift the vehicle, the angle just becomes too steep. So if you can twist that, uh, differential up towards the uh, transmission, it helps alleviate a lot of the binding and a lot of the uh, vibration that you can get from an excessive angle coming out of the uh, U-joint. The angle of this rear card of U-joint is noticeable. So you can see, basically you draw an invisible line through here, okay? And then draw an invisible line through here. Obviously that's not the best drawing, but you can see that we have pretty much an excess, two excessive angle. So this vehicle probably been lifted before and you can see it's been pushed down. And when it pushes down, it pushes further away from the transmission, causing it to actually be at a pretty steep angle, which we would want to do an adjustment on this. Um, and usually, like I said, you can use the shims that go under the leaf pack and actually tilt the, uh, the differential upward. The forearms of the U-joint across the, uh, the U-joint cross are referred to as what? So. Excuse my drawing. So this section here, this section here, this section here, and this section here, what are they called? That's correct, trunnions. So there's needle bearings inside. When you're pulling these off, be very careful. Don't lose any of the needle bearings if you have to put it back on. The reason why is now you have a lot of play inside. Eventually that, um, that new joint's gonna give way and it's gonna go ahead and destroy it. And when it starts to get, uh, when it dis gets destroyed, Guess what it's attached to? Yes, the dry shaft and the differential. So you're probably gonna to have to replace the, the actual yokes on the dry shaft and the yokes on the differential. Double carbon joints. Regular U-joints are usually designed to work up to 12 degrees of angularity. If two carbon style U-joints are joined together, the angle in which this double carbon joint can function is about 18 to 20 degrees. So instead of having your output shaft for the transmission, you have your differential down here. And instead of having it just a super steep angle here, what we're going to utilize is what is known as a double carded joint. You guys will see it in the next slide right now. So actually we'll utilize a, a basically two U-joints put together, but instead of doing just straight down like this, it actually creates a nice smooth angle. So it's basically like a little adapter uh, style U-joint and it uses two of them, puts two together, and causes a nice smooth transition down to the actual differential. So you're allowed for more angle, uh, especially working with a lot of uh, custom work. Constant velocity joints, CV joints. Now we're going to be talking about these bad boys here. You're going to have two different types per actual joint. So the purpose and function, constant velocity joints, commonly called CV joints, are designed to rotate without changing speed. So this eliminates the binding and the issues that you get with a U-joint or a double carded joint. r zeppel joints, the r zeppel joint transfers torque through six round balls that are held in position midway between the two shafts. That would be this guy right here. So we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna try to pull it apart quickly just to show you guys the parts. And then outer CV joints, the r zeppel type CV joint is most commonly used as the outer joint in most front wheel drive vehicles. That is the joint right there. 
Interceding joints have to be able to allow the drive axle shaft to move up and down and allow the drive axle sh shaft to change length as required during vehicle suspension travel suspension travel movements. That is this guy here. This is called a plunge joint. So you can actually allow the drive shaft to the axle shaft to actually get longer and get shorter to allow because the suspension goes up and down, so it has to be able to go um, pretty much be able to extend. But when you think of a dry shaft, how the dry shaft actually slides out and slides back in, this one, both sides, this side mounts inside the transmission, this side mounts on a axle hub or wheel hub, slides in and you put the large nut on the other side. Now power is gonna be transmitted through like this, but as you notice, these are fixed mounted. So these don't slide in and out, it's actually the plunge joint here. So it's actually, the that uh, allows it to change its length, but also still allow for the flexibility and the movement. Drive, drive axle shafts, unequal length drive axle shafts, also called half shafts, result in unequal drive axle sh uh, shaft angles to front drive wheels. Some vehicles are manufactured with an intermediate shaft that results in equal drive axle shaft angles. CV boot material. CV boots are made from either natural rubber, silicone rubber, or hard thermal plastic or urethane. And the CV joint grease. Most CV joint grease is molybdenum disulfide tied grease, commonly referred to as molly grease. You don't want to put just any old grease inside of these. Don't put just WD-40 or you know one of those uh, die pen or the penetrating lubes. The reason why is these take a lot of abuse, just like pretty much any other suspension and steering part. When you are repacking these, um, it's a little different than repacking regular bearings. These ones you actually have to kind of just put put a good amount inside them. Um, they're, they're you know they're relatively s simple to take apart. So this one's been taken apart a lot. That's probably why it's so hard. But as you can see, I just popped open the joint itself. So first you're going to start to remove the bearings. So you pull one bearing out. Pull the other bearing out. And you rotate it. You get the bearing is actually coming through. Come on. I knew I was gonna be fighting this thing. Okay. Come on, get out. See, see, now you don't mess me up. Keeps popping in the other joint. All right, got one more, one more to go, or two more to go. So pull those bearings out. It's just like the differential. Once you get the hang of it, but there's still always a tr always troublesome. Okay. Get another ball. And last but not least, got the last one. So there's the six balls that they're talking about. Or five. I'm going to pull off the center, center portion. Okay. And then you pull out the cage. Cage comes out a certain direction. There it goes. So that's all the basic components of this CV joint. Now remember these ones do not slide in and out. These are just the fixed elbow. These are the ones, this is called the plunge joint. These are the ones that actually change. As you can see, just slide it right on out. So the only thing basically keeping this one on is the CV boot, which is supposed to have a clip on one side and clip on the other side. And it's got three bearings on it. Now it's two bearings. And you can see this has got the three and these actually slide in and out, stupid thing. And when they flex and move, you can see they actually have a little bit of leeway inside of them. Come on, get back in there. So you have a little bit of leeway, but mostly they're just made to slide back and forth, but allow that movement, that extra play. And they're allowed to change the length. And I'm not gonna try and reassemble this. You guys are just staring at me for 20 minutes. A constant velocity joint, a CV joint can operate at high angles without changing in velocity or speed because the joint design results in unequal angles between input and output. So you're allowed for they're allowed for them to move the power transferring through doesn't change that speed you don't get vibrations you get you know there's very very little downside to this design I'm gonna use this
There are very little downsides to this design. Uh, they are zip a fixed joint. This type of CV joint is commonly used as front, uh, at the wheel side of the drive axle shaft. This joint can operate at high angles to compensate for suspension travel and steering angle changes. Now, not only are these to help transfer motion through, but they're allowed to uh, let the suspension move. So these are actually to help with turning and also with the suspension moving up and down. And I, like I said, it doesn't change the velocity, so you're not gonna get binding, you're not gonna get vibration. You could get vibration from the longer shafts due to the fact that the shaft's moving up and down, but we have an isolator that actually gets put on the shaft to help uh, absorb the vibration. The protective CV boot our CV joint boot has been torn away from this vehicle and all the grease has been thrown outward onto the brake and suspension parts. The driver of this vehicle noticed a clicking noise, especially when turning. When you run into a vehicle that the customer says, oh, this vehicle, it, uh, when I'm driving it, when I turn left and I turn right, the, it starts to click. When you hear the clicking noise, it's usually due to an outer CV joint. Uh, most in inner CV joints don't make that noise is because you're putting extra force on this actual uh, joint here and then you're hearing the clicking so it's actually binding inside because everything's starting to wear away. You know, not everything has a, a shelf life and, um, or not a shelf life, let's say just, especially parts that move and flex and, you know, cause them to actually rub, eventually they're gonna give way. There's, you know, there's no, there's no such thing as lifetime CV joints or even the uh, plunge joints. Um, you're going to notice that a clicking noise is heard when you're turning, so that's going to be more noticeable. It's basically, uh, it's like a telltale sign that your outer CV joints are starting to go bad. A tripod fixed joint. This type of joint is found on some Japanese vehicles. If the joint wears out, it is to be replaced with an entire drive axle shaft assembly. So instead of just replacing one part or trying to rebuild these, you can rebuild these. The only downside is most of the parts are going to be a lot harder to find and you still have to charge your customer more labor to actually get the rebuild. So you might as well just replace the entire axle. That's what mostly, most of the time what we do. The fixed outer joint is required to move in all directions because the wheels must turn for steering as well as move up and down during suspension movement. The inner joint has to be able to not only move up and down but also plunge in and out as the suspension moves up and down. So it allows to do this, but it allows to actually change its length. When it changes its length, it's because the suspension is going down when it comes up, it goes back inside the plunge joint. Unequal length drive shafts result in unequal drive axle shaft angles to the front ground wheels. This unequal, unequal angle side to the side often results in a steering of the vehicle during acceleration called torque steer, which we've already gone over. By using an intermediate shaft, both drive axles are the same angle and the torque steer effect is reduced. So we have an intermediate shaft in the middle. This allows to actually give you the same axle shaft length, but like I said, not every vehicle has this. You're gonna have a long drive shaft going to the, dip, uh, the transmission or the transaxle, and you're gonna get eventually torque steer. This is more for, used for performance vehicles to help alleviate torque steer, but you, it can still be noticeable. A typical drive, a drive axle with a damper weight. So this damper weight to help absorb vibration. A lot of them use just a rubber uh, isolator on it to help absorb vibration, keep down the shaking, and um, let's say you're driving a customer's vehicle and they say they have a vibration coming from the front. If these little rubber guys had fallen off, it is definitely going to exacerbate the situation, making the vibration a lot, hard, uh, a lot more noticeable. A tripod, tripod joint is also called a tripod, a tripod or a tulip design. This is the one that we're actually, it's pretty much this design here. Um, I've seen ones where you can see you have these little grooves in the actual outer edge, but there's ones that are way more noticeable from the outside, like especially just like this one here. A cross groove plunge joint is used on many German front wheel drive vehicles and as both inner and outer joints on the rear vehicles that use an independent type rear suspension. So that is this one here, the cross groove, or cro I'm sorry, cross groove. So I actually found the other balls. Yeah. So there's only so many parts for this design. Like I said, it's, sometimes it's a hassle to get it all rebuilt, so I'm not gonna do it for the lecture. A double offset ball type, ball type plunge joint. Oh wait, oh no. They're pretty much the same. Um, let me see. Yeah, they're pretty much the same design. 
Um, let's see. Yeah, so both of them are pretty much the same. It's just the insides here that are actually a little different. Many outer CV joints include the tone wheel for the wheel speed sensor used by the anti-lock and stability control systems. We went over Greg's last module about ABS. So a lot of the axles are gonna have this ring here. And if you have a vehicle with four wheel ABS or at least um, three channel ABS, you need to make sure that if this ring isn't on the new axles, that you either take off, take it off from the old axle, put it on the new one, or find the axle, the correct axles that actually have it. Because what if you put the axle in and this ring's not on it, what's gonna happen? That's right, you're gonna get a check engine light or you're gonna get an ABS light. That's gonna turn on and it's gonna de deactivate ABS and it's gonna deactivate your traction control. Many CV joints are close to the exhaust system where they're exposed to higher than normal temperatures. So because of the tight spaces, you have your exhaust manifold that comes under the engine, crosses over by the transaxle. Now that heat can break away at the actual boot. And when these boots start to tear, they open up and there's all kinds of grease packed in there. It's gonna start throwing grease all over the place. What are the four materials typically used to make a CV boot? Natural rubber, silicone rubber, hard thermoplastic, or urethane. So, when it comes down to servicing axles, I hardly recommend re rebuilding them. The only thing I actually do is recommend replacement. Not only does it make your life easier because you can get the job done faster and you're still gonna get you know some decent hours to it, but you're not gonna get all dirty. Like I barely even touch these. These have been here and taken apart so many times. There's still tons of grease on them. Now, if this uh, plunge joint here, if I were to open it when it was fresh, there'd be all kinds of grease in there. There's, a, there's like hardly any compared to how the, it actually should be packed with grease. You know, there's hardly not enough grease in there. So this goes to show when you start losing grease, you're gonna start to hear um, a lot of clicking. You're gonna hear, uh, not necessarily you're gonna hear binding, but you're gonna feel like some sort of shudder and like grabbing, and then eventually it's gonna break. So we definitely want to avoid that by preventing it from actually happening. So if you notice one of the CV boots is actually torn, recommend replacement of the actual axle because once it starts to go and it snaps, then you're gonna leave the driver stranded. They'll be like, oh, you did an inspection on my car. Why didn't you tell me about it? At least let them know and tell them to write it down. They don't have to do it right away, but at least you're covered when, you put, uh, when the car comes back because they didn't listen to your recommendations. All right, you guys? If you guys have any questions, like I said, um, in the last couple lectures, just go ahead and um, hold on to them, write them down, and then when we get into our Instagram, uh, ask me any questions that you have, or you can actually go on the comments page and actually write a comment, and then I can answer as quickly as, uh, as possible. Alrighty guys, I'll see you guys later.